so fascinated with the ability of the gut to protect us from foreign molecules that it encounters daily, like, you know, food and toxins. But yet it, it's got this leakiness to it that it, it enables it to absorb nutrients. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Miller is going to help us to understand the causes of the unhealthy leakiness of the gut, the leaky gut, and what we can do to heal it. And Dr. Miller will also talk about food sensitivities and how they might be different from food allergies or intolerances and what we can do about that also. So welcome, Dr. Miller. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so excited for you Thank to you. talk. Um yeah, this is an important talk to me. It's something that I personally have gone through a lot of, and I see it in so many of my patients. So I wanted to share some tips with people. Well, that's so nice. And what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our true or false. It's time for true or false on Be Green with Amy Live. Answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below, and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Well, since we're talking about the gut today, I have a true or false question for you guys. So type in your answer. The microbes in your gut are adapted to whatever you've been eating in the last three months, true or false. And while they type in those answers, Dr. Miller, what do you have to say? Um, do you want me to give the answer? To yes, that? sure. Go ahead. So that is absolutely true. Yeah, whatever you eat, it will reflect even sooner than three months, but absolutely by three months, you will completely alter your microbiome if you eat a good diet or a less healthy diet. Okay, so we're gonna have talk about a couple more things and then we're gonna let Dr. Miller do a presentation and she'll probably expand on some of the things that we're gonna be bringing up mm -hmm. with our true or false questions. And here's another one, true or false, one of the top causes of ulcers is NSAIDs or like ibuprofen. Okay, Dr. Miller? Yeah, unfortunately, this is very true. Um, if you ask me, I think uh, ibuprofen and NSAIDs should not be over the counter because they come with so many risks from they disrupt the, the lining of your of your gut and cause stress or and cause ulcers and lacerations and lesions in there, but they also cause kidney problems. They're just not something you want to be taking all the time. And um, so it's an extremely common cause because people don't realize that it comes with risks when they take it. So they take it thinking it's no big deal, but it is. Right, Especially sure. if you take it long term. If you just take it once or twice here or there, it's probably less of a problem. But if you're on it all the time, that's where we start to see problems. Oh, so true. And I'm sure there's some of the, in the packaging, it might have in very fine print, some of those things are in it. Yeah, <laughs> typically, so. when, typically when you're about to take it, you're not in the mood to, to read that. Right. <laughs> okay, right. here, here's another one. Um, high fructose fruits can cause bloating. Yeah, this is actually really true. Um, and the reason is because the, the fruits, those high fructose, they can be fermented by your microbiome and they lead to a lot of bloating. And so often too, when people are just going plant-based, they'll find they get bloating with these high fructose fruit, or if you eat too many of them or too many in combination that have high fructose, you'll start to get the gas and bloating. And so you can start to improve it just by slowing down, taking out the high fructose fruits initially and uh, gradually building your microbiome to tolerate it and then finding out what your limit is. Maybe you can eat one or two pieces, but not five or six pieces. So you can make adjustments over time. Okay. True or false, most grocery store yogurts are not truly fermented. Hmm. Yeah, Take unfortunately... Unfortunately, that's definitely true. So um, the, the whole point of it is giving the, the live bacteria, usually lactobacillus or, or whatever it is that's in yogurt, into your um, gut. And if it's not refrigerated or if it's not actually live when they first put it in there, um, or if they had a lot of sweeteners, then we find that there's no benefit to those yogurts. Okay. And then we have one more. True or false, bone broth heals the gut. True or false? Well, there's a lot of people making the claim that it does. So you'll see bone broth all over the place for people with gut issues, leaky gut. Um, and so people are trying it for sure. And if you look at the data, there's no real good data supporting that it, that it does heal the gut. And um, so 
I don't recommend bone broth personally. Um, you don't need it to heal the, the gut. Um, I've healed, helped a lot of people improve their guts without bone broth, and it can come with risks. Um, Dr. Greger on nutritionfacts.com talks about the lead that has been found contaminating a lot of bone broths, um, that, and the lead comes from the bones themselves. They leach out of the bones or other toxins that leach out of the bones as they're making the bone broth. And um, yeah, so there's no reason why you need to have bone broth to heal as far as I'm concerned. Does it truly heal? It may, but there's no studies that we know yet. And I don't think it's worth the risks. And so I don't use it. Okay, well, that's good to know, because I think there's a lot of things going around on the internet that people are kind of trying to think about. And you kind of clarified that for us. So this leaky gut, I mean, some of us may that are watching or listening, some of you may be experiencing it or knowing somebody that does. And then I, I liked how when you were suggesting a topic for our talk today that you talked about the leaky gut, but then you also wanted to, at the same uh, broadcast, wanted to discuss the food sensitivities. So I find that that's interesting. And I guess we're going to find out how the, they're kind of connected. So what do you want to talk about? Um, well, I want to talk about kind of all of all of the big picture because it's one it's one entity basically. If your gut gets uh, disrupted, then the microbiome gets disrupted, the gut lining gets disrupted, and you start having all these symptoms, including food sensitivities, where all of a sudden you're not tolerating foods that you may have eaten your whole life, and they're normal healthy foods, and uh, and you're having a reaction to it. So, and people are coming in with all sorts of symptoms and complaints that are related. To the gut and so if they have a rash or a headache or fatigue autoimmune diseases all sorts of joint pains um psoriasis skin lesions um, hypothyroid rheumatoid arthritis right all of these autoimmune diseases any of these symptoms um chronic fatigue i first thing i'm thinking about is their gut and so that's why i want to tie it all that's why we're gonna, it's tied together and we're gonna go over all of that too today Wow, it's just so fascinating, and it's relatively new information in the in the scheme of things with, yeah. with the science. So it should be very interesting to hear hear what you want to talk about. Yeah, so I broke it down, and I can go over this. I put together a simple little talk, and then after that, I thought you and I could just talk about it or take questions. Sure. Go. Um, so I, do you want me to bring it up now? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So. Um, as Dr. Miller said, she's going to be doing this presentation, but all of you that are watching and listening, please feel free to type in the comments any questions that you may have for Dr. Miller. And then once the presentation is over, we're going to go into the chat and bring them up to, so that Dr. Miller can try to answer as many as she can. So while you're watching, if something comes to mind, just type it in and we'll look at it a little bit later. Are you ready, Dr. Miller? I'm ready. Yes. Okay. Let's do this. Okay, so understanding and healing leaky gut um, is a topic for, for the day. All diseases begin in the gut. This was Hippocrates back in 460 BC. This man was smart because he's totally right. Um, and I really agree with him. Okay, I wanna talk about a patient of mine. Her name is Amy and I've changed her name. Amy is a 53 year old woman um, who came to see me with throat swelling, itching, and it was swelling after eating food and it was almost everything she ate, she felt that way. Itching, dryness um, in her mouth that seems to go into her lungs. She had severe fatigue. She had many food sensitivities. Um, some of them that uh, she talked about right away were oranges, cheese, all dairy products, pickles, strawberries, shelled seafood, and spinach. Um, she's been seen by multiple doctors. She's, she was diagnosed with asthma and reflux, um, heartburn, basically, and given inhalers and proton pump inhibitors. And then she came to see me. And so my questions when I saw her, um, or, and for all of you guys now, is why did people get the food sensitivities? Isn't that strange that she couldn't eat spinach? I mean, that's crazy, right? Um, what, are, what are the root cause or what is the root cause of Amy's symptoms? Um, why does she have this throat swelling and the food sensitivities? What's going on? And how can we help her heal? Um, not just cover up the symptoms, but actually heal from the inside out. Um, so today we're talking about the root cause. And that brings us to talking about the microbiome imbalance. So what, what goes wrong is, um, and I guess I should back it up I, and have it I should have a slide here. So imagine there's a slide right now about how when it goes right. So there's this 
um, lumen, this tube that goes all the way from your mouth, all the way down into your esophagus, into your stomach, into all your intestines, and then to your anus and, um, and out the other end. And it's just one tube and it is um, a lumen. So it's got endothelia, which is the inside layer, which is very active and it's, it opens and closes. So it's not just always closed and sealed tight, but it opens to let nutrients in, but it, it stays closed to keep out uh, waste products and toxins and environmental things that it doesn't want to absorb. So it's very good at selectively absorbing the correct nutrients, but that's it. And it has a microbiome that lines it and it, and it's, um, supposed to be in good balance and it protects us. So that's the, that's how it's supposed to be. And then we eat food, we tolerate it. We don't have food sensitivities and we go about a happy little life. But then people like Amy start to have these imbalances, which is so very common in this world. And so my question right away is why are we getting these imbalances? What's going on? And that's where we're going to dig into right now. So what is going on where, where this is coming from is the microbiome gets in balance. And I'm going to talk about why that happens. Then the gut, instead of being um, tightly, um, tightly held together by these tight junctions, it becomes leaky. So instead of keeping out toxins and bacteria and waste products, that starts to actually come across where it's not supposed to. And we start to develop food sensitivities and all of these other symptoms that Amy and other people are feeling. Um, How is the microbiome formed in the first place? Well, it's sterile or we have a very low amount of micro of bacteria in utero. They're showing now that maybe there's just a few, but it's not very much. And then we're born, right? If, if you're born through um, vaginal birth, you go through the vaginal canal and you get colonized. If you're C-section, then you're colonized when you're born, right after birth. Um, breast milk helps to um, give nutrients to develop a proper microbiome, a proper balance of microbiome. And then growing up as a kid, right? Babies, they're putting everything in their mouths. They're playing in the dirt. They, if you have pets in the house, if you have plants in the house, if, you, if they're out in nature, all of this is going to affect a microbiome as a as a child is developing. Um, and then for our whole lives, our diet is gonna affect our microbiome. So whether we eat fiber, and I'm gonna show you why that's so very important for the microbiome, whether we eat proper nutrients, if we're nutrient deficient, if we're missing anything. And if we eat high fats, that's gonna destroy our microbiome. And I'll show you why that is too. Um, the environment that we live in affects our microbiome. So, um, you know, if you live in Florida, that's going to be one microbiome. If you live in Colorado, where I live, that's going to be a different microbiome. So um, the environment does matter whether you live, you know, you're outdoors a lot, um, things like that. And then the time of the day that you actually, the, the microbiome actually changes time of day. So it's so interesting looking at it in the, in the nighttime when you're not eating, you're not digesting food, um, it's going to be different microbiome that are more prevalent than than earlier in the day. So um, when the job is to digest food and keep out toxins and, and so they kind of come, different ones kind of play a role at different times of day. Um, sleep definitely affects our microbiome and age as we, as we um, get older, it changes just by aging alone. And then other fa factors, and this is what we hear a lot of. So um, toxins, taking in toxins, and I, I'm going to talk a lot about different toxins that we might eat. And that's often through our foods, right? If it's non-organic, all the chemicals, pesticides, additives, things like that. Medications. So antibiotics are very well known to, to disrupt our microbiome, but so are NSAIDs. So that's ibuprofen. And that's what Amy asked us about. So absolutely that disrupts our microbiome. Prednisone. So for all of us, like myself, people with autoimmune diseases that have been on prednisone for a long time. It definitely disrupts our microbiome. And that's why I want people to work as hard as you can with your doctor um, or someone like me, if you don't have a doctor, but to help you get to the point where you don't need prednisone and you can get off it. It's really important that we do that um, and get off it because it does disrupt your microbiome and your gut lining. Um, artificial sweeteners have been shown to do this. Hand sanitizers. I know we all did it during COVID. We sort of had to. We were scared. I was too. But, you know, it's best if you can use um, soap and water is really the best versus all of these hand sanitizers that just destroy everything on your hands. Um, trauma. So if you've been experienced with big trauma, that can affect your microbiome. Infections. If you get a gastroenteritis or a little diarrhea one day, that can affect it for sure. If you smoke, if you live, if you're very stressed out and how much you exercise. 
So this was an interesting thing. And I bring this up because when we talk about the gut, we have to talk about stress. Stress affects the gut tremendously. The, di the difference between a healthy gut and one that is unhealthy, that has gas and bloating and leaky gut and um, food sensitivities can be stress alone. I'm not kidding you guys. It is that important. Stress. Um, so, and this was a study that came out in 2017 and showed that chronic stress, they tested people who were chronically under stress, they were caregivers and they were very stressed out, um, discombobulated the gut microbiome communities. And this title was in the paper. This was in the paper. This was it. So um, I didn't make that up. And so you can see down here, the lower part of this, um, the gut microbiome that it communicates um, versus neurotransmitters versus the vagus nerve um, versus cytokines up to the brain and it goes but it goes both ways. It's both way communication. And um, so if you are stressed out in your head, that's going to go to your gut and alter the microbiome. And that's going to go up and alter, alter your brain and your mental health and your anxiety and your depression and worry and all these feelings that people feel. Um, okay, so functions of the microbiome, just so you understand it. And this is a gut lining here. And this is the endothelium that's one cell layer thick. This is your microbiome, nice, healthy microbiome. And right underneath this one cell layer thick, and, and you can see they're very tight together and they're held together by these tight junctions uh, in between. And just underneath them is your immune system. Boom, here's your immune system. So if anything comes in, it's gonna mess up your immune system. And these bacteria here are actually communicating with your immune system. So they talk all the time. You could see it talking right here. They're talking um, via receptors and, and things like that. And um, so this is a nice, healthy, beautiful, this is the way it's supposed to look. Um, so our microbiome is our first line of immune system defense. So it's super important. It forms metabolites that can either protect our gut and let have it look like this. This beautiful gut is protected right now, or it can damage our gut. And this is what we're seeing all the time. It gets damaged. And our microbiome actually produces vitamins, essential amino acids, fatty acids, neurotransmitters, hormones for us. They affect our mood, regulate our metabolism, help us with digestion, and they actually detoxify us. It's our first form of detoxification. The microbiome, it's all about balance. It's not like one bacteria is bad and one is good but you want a balance. So if it looks like this, so the, these cause um, anti-inflammation, these regulate your immune system and build tolerance and these cause inflammation. And you want to, you don't want none of this because if you have none of this, it's going to tip the other way. Um, but you don't want too much of this either. And we see a lot of people that get too much of this and we live with this chronic inflammation state. So we're all about bringing balance and that's what this is all about. So how to bring balance? Well, number one, two, and three is fiber, 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 basically. Um, and, and along with fibers, resistant starch, which is not actually a fiber, but it's kind of like a fiber because fiber means it's not broken down in your gut. It's a type of um, uh, a starch that is not broken down. You can't digest it and you can't digest resistant starch. This isn't actually a starch and it's not, neither of these are digestible, but not by us. We human beings cannot digest these, but our beautiful little microbiome can. And so they are, um, they're digested by our microbiome. And so these are some resistant starch has been shown to be, it passes through your small intestine untouched and in the colon where a lot of the microbiome live, the majority of them, um, the resistant starch is digested. And these have been shown, all of them really fiber and resistant starch, but all of them have been shown to help uh, rebuild the microbiome and to give off the good metabolites that protect us from disease, from food sensitivities, from aging, from leaky gut, from all of this. And so we want to be focusing on fiber and resistant starch in our diet. And I listed this 28 great sources of resistant starch. So it's banana, especially green bananas. Um, there's a lot of different legumes, beans, sourdough bread, right? Because it's fermented. Um, millet, brown rice, a lot of our grains are here. Corn is here. Um, there's so many more. This is There's so many more. But again, all of our beans are such good forms. Our leafy greens are also good forms. So, so those aren't really here. Peas they have. But there's so many more. So there's a lot of good sources that we basically our whole food plant based diet is packed with them. So that is um, why that diet is going to be number one on our treatment plan.
Um, so healthy microbiome, healthy metabolites. And when your, your microbiome is making short chain fatty acids, SCFSAs, these are short chain fatty acids. And these are the three big ones. And especially butyrate, butyrate is going to protect your intestinal cell barrier. It's going to prevent leaky gut. And that's what we're worried about, right? We want to, we want to have a nice, nice, healthy cell um, lining that endothelial where it's all nice and tight together and it prevents leaky gut. And it helps us with water and electrolyte absorption, just like it's supposed to. It's energy and it, to heal our colon and it's important modulators of our immune system. Um, so what happens when we eat a high fat and sugar diet though? So that's what happens when we eat a, this is what happens when we eat a high fiber diet and resistant starch diet. We see the healthy microbiome metabolites. But what happens when we eat a high fat sugar diet? Well, we instead of producing those healthy metabolites, the acetate, propionate, and butyrate, we now produce more, we still produce some of those, but we produce more of the lipopolysaccharide. And this is um, a toxin. This is a toxin. And it's found in certain pathogenic bacteria. So um, if we eat meat products, meat and meat products, we will have LPS. Uh, if we have a leaky gut, we have LPS, leaky, uh, lip lipopolysaccharides leaking across our gut. And um, if we eat high fat and sugar diets, we also get LPS leaking across our gut. So it's in all of those. And um, what happens is, remember this nice, healthy bacteria lining that we had, and there's this mucus layer here on top of it. Well, what happens is um, when we're eating this high fat and high sugar diet, um, it goes from being healthy like this to um, the mucus layer starts to break down. The bacteria are starting to change your microbiome because you're not feeding them fiber anymore. So you lose these healthy microbiome. The microbiome wall starts to break down. And now the immune system starts to go on hyper alert. These guys are like, wait a minute, stuff can start coming across here. And these guys are getting all, all activated. And there's your immune system. And this is where now we're gonna have food sensitivities. You're gonna eat foods and those foods are gonna come across and cause problems where you shouldn't have that. So if you're getting food sensitivities, you know your gut looks something like this and we want it to look something like this. We wanna go back to that. So um, we can suppress this by resistant starch, by fiber, and maybe by some prebiotics or probiotics. But, um, but so this is, so this hopefully helps you understand what's happening. So healthy gut versus leaky gut, I kind of just showed you that in the last slide. Again, healthy gut has these tight junctions and um, no food particles or bacteria. They go across through these microvilli and through receptors. This is how they're supposed to get across, but they don't come across between. So when it's not healthy, when it breaks down, then it starts to come across between. And now your immune system goes across and now you have food sensitivities and now you have all these other um, autoimmune diseases and all these other symptoms that people are, are having. So, so that's leaky gut for you. So what are the symptoms of it? It's all of the stuff, you guys, it's stuff that people are seeing. So it's all the digestive issues, the gas and the bloating and the constipation and the diarrhea. Those can all be symptoms. They can be symptoms of it. Um, it's it's uh, having chronic loose stools, right? It's having irritable bowel syndrome and not tolerating the high fructose fruits anymore. Um, it's, it's, um, it's people with autoimmune diseases, people with acne, headaches, ADHD. Um, it's all of these symptoms and it's definitely food sensitivities, right? Food intolerances is right here in the middle for a reason, because that's a big deal with it. How to test if you have leaky gut. Really the best test is a clinical one. You, you don't need to do testing. The testing is, is, is not entirely that accurate yet. And there's, there's still relatively newer tests and they're, they're not always 100% correct. They may miss it and you do have it or they may say you have it and you don't really have it. But um, the best is a clinical. So if you have these symptoms, if you're experiencing a lot of this, you can guess that your gut lining is breaking down, as I showed you. Um, you can do what's called a lactulose mannitol test where you drink it and these are supposed to be absorbed across, or I'm sorry, this one's supposed to be absorbed across. Um, the lactulose is not supposed to be absorbed across. And so if you see the lactulose being absorbed across, meaning you pee it out, meaning it was absorbed into your bloodstream and into your kidneys to pee it out, then you have leaky gut. So, you know, we don't really do this test very much, truthfully. It's it's expensive and it's it's not necessarily 
it's not really necessary, but you can do it if you're curious or you're not sure and you just want to know. You can do it. Zonulin is a newer test and it's um, it's leaked out from those tight junctions. So when those tight junctions break, as I showed you, the zonulin leaks out and that can be measured in your blood. So that's a blood test. And we can do comprehensive stool exams where we kind of look at all of this stuff all at once. Um, but truthfully, for the majority of patients, if they come in with with rashes or headaches or fatigue or autoimmune disease, joint pains that, or food sensitivities, I know they have leaky gut, so we're gonna treat it for leaky gut. Um, so what can you do? I know this is what you guys all wanna know, and we're gonna talk much more about this, but I just put a few things here, because um, this is something I do every single day with my patients. But the most important things are to remove those trigger foods. So if, if you know Amy knew she was sensitive to spinach or dairy products, she has to take them out, no question. Remove trigger foods. If you eat a food and it seems to bother you, you, you don't wanna keep eating it. That can be individual trigger foods, like just that just you have, or there's certain ones that are known to be more allergenic, um, such as, dairy products, gluten, um, seafood, eggs. These are known to cause um, problems in people. Avoid foods that worsen leaky gut. Um, so these are these are ones that we know worsen it. Um, and there's data actually to support this. The number one food that worsens leaky gut, um, I'm gonna give you guys a second to see if you can guess. What's the number one food from this list here that, we, that worsens leaky gut? Okay, type in the answer and then- I'm curious if people know this. Between yeah. animal products, dairy, oils, sugar, gluten, processed foods, food additives, and sweeteners. Okay, we're having some people are saying dairy. So we're still, why don't you just go ahead and- Yeah, we'll, so we'll the answer that. is, you guys are correct. That's awesome. It's dairy. <laughs> dairy is the number one worst food. It immediately starts disrupting those- um, tight junctions and causes inflammation. So this is a thing when if you're on a healing plan and you're getting better and you accidentally, I'm putting this in quotations, you accidentally have a little bit of cheese or you accidentally have a little bit of milk chocolate, you're going to re-trigger your, your leaky gut and cause all sorts of problems again. That LPS leaks across again and and you're it's going to bring you back to where you were. And sometimes people have horrific reactions after they've been clean for a little while. So number one, all dairy has to go and has to stay out if you've had leaky gut, um, which we know it's not good for us anyway. And Amy can tell you all about that. So um, we, it, it should go anyway. But animal products are going to trigger it. Oils will trigger it. Sugar, you know, if you have like half a teaspoon or something, it's not going to trigger it. But, you know, in higher amounts, it will. Gluten absolutely does. It's very well known. Even if you're not celiac, um, when you're having leaky gut, then I recommend people don't eat gluten for a short time. Processed foods, absolutely they trigger it. So this is a reason we see a lot of people who are plant-based and eating plant-based, you know, crackers and cookies or other plant process, processed plant-based foods. And then they may come in with leaky gut, which they never used to have. So it can be just from those foods. Food additives, sweeteners. Um, so what else you can do? You can remove high fat foods. A high fat diet, as I showed you in that slide, will increase your LPS and increase some of the bad um, toxins and 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 hurt your, your gut lining. So if you want to heal leaky gut, you want to eat higher fiber foods, lower in fat. A little bit of nuts and seeds is fine. A little bit of avocado is fine. But, you know, you're not doing a high fat diet. You're definitely not doing oils or any other high fat foods. Then you want to add in the pro-inflammatory foods. So this is the high fiber. I showed you why that's so important. Fiber and resistant starch, whole food, plant-based diet. Um, green leafy vegetables have shown to have their own microbiome if you eat them raw. And they talk to the microbiome that when you eat them, they, they don't talk, but they release metabolic, they, they communicate via microbiome communication. And um, they can actually help replenish your microbiome faster than almost anything else that they found. So with green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables, I'll add to that, are both um, super important for healing. Fermented foods, I wanted to bring this up. When you have leaky gut, many people do not tolerate fermented foods. So you may see like, oh, eat fermented foods. It heals you. It, it diversifies your bacteria, which it does. I am a fan of, of fermented foods. I think people, sh healthy people should eat fermented foods. And by that, I mean kimchi, um, sauerkraut, your own fermented vegetables that you make at home, things like that. And um, they are beneficial. But if you have leaky gut and food sensitivities, I don't, I don't add them in at the beginning. Those come in later. So when people are improved, when your leaky gut is improving and it's repairing itself and you're doing great, then we'll bring in a little bit of fermented foods. And then you do want to eat it to have a 
to have a healthy microbiome, but not too early. And so I actually have a whole system of steps um, that I work on with patients. So they go stepwise um, and make sure that they're healing before they go to the next step. Because if you do it out of order, you can kind of screw it up a little bit. So I'm just giving you guys the basic thing. So hopefully you can do some of these steps, um, these tips, uh, and it will work for you. But, um, but there is like a kind of an order to it. But this is super important because that leaky gut, undigested food can trigger your leaky gut and it can make it worse. Once your gut is already leaky, it can't trigger, I'm sorry. Once your gut is already leaky, undigested food will keep it going. It will it'll prevent it from healing. It kind of makes it worse. So you, this is why a lot of people are blending food, blended soups, um, blended smoothies, or um, doing things like green juices are very beneficial. Chewing your food really, really, really well. Good old Dr. Clapper, I love him. He always talks about the importance, and he has for years, about chewing your food till it's a liquid. And he's so right, it's so true. You really wanna chew your food till it's liquefied. Um, so eat slow, eat mindfully um, in a non-stressful environment, chew it well. And that's really important to healing like you got intermittent fasting so not eating all the time so having periods of not eating allows your gut to heal itself it just like if you're walking on a twisted ankle when is it going to heal it's going to hurt at the end of the day because you walked all day on it right but you have to rest it for at least the night time or as long as you can to let it heal before you get back walking same thing with your gut if your gut is damaged and you're walking on it or eating with it all day long and and into the evening it's never going to get a chance to heal so intermittent fasting really can help heal leaky gut pretty quickly and then lifestyle factors, I can't say enough about them. Stress management is number one, is up there with eating greens and eating well. So um, if you're stressed out, you won't heal your leaky gut. I see this in so many stressed out people. So we work so hard. I work so hard with my patients to help them not be stressed or manage it or change your perception of stress because stress is obviously happening in this world. It's going to keep happening. So we, we don't want to let it hurt us and damage our microbiome and our gut lining. So we have you know, we have to work on these different techniques. And Amy, you and I have talked about breath work and mind body work. And, and that's why it's so important to heal for us to heal. Um, exercise, an exercising person has a healthy microbiome. It's for sure true. So even if you can just start with 10 minutes a day or start with walks, whatever you can do, exercise will help your microbiome. Sleeping, um, when you sleep, it actually starts to heal. So if you're not getting quality sleep there, um, you want to work on a sleep hygiene routine. And um, there's so many good tricks and tips to helping people sleep better. So um, that's something to make sure that you're working on your sleep if you're not a good sleeper. Time in nature helps to heal your microbiome. And um, I added this last one here because I didn't know where to put it, but it's important to make sure you're not deficient in any nutrients. So in my patients, I check their nutrients. I do some labs and some testing and, and take a look um, at where things are. And then supplements that may be helpful for some people. And I say may be helpful for, oh, I'm sorry, my computer did something crazy there, but um, may be helpful for some people, meaning it's not for everyone. I don't use these for everyone. The ones I use for everyone is I use vitamin D and B12. Make sure you're, if, especially if you're plant-based, which I hope you are working in that direction. If you're trying to heal a leaky gut, um, that you're taking B12 and your vitamin D is adequate. So make sure those are okay. And then these, I don't use these all the time, but I wanted to list them here because a lot of people talk about them. Probiotics are helpful for certain people with immune disorders. Um, autoimmunes, they can be helpful. They're not helpful for all gut stuff. I do not use them routinely for every gut thing. And there's been some recent data showing that probiotics actually may slow um, the, after you take antibiotics, taking probiotics may slow the, the restoration of all the diversity of the microbiome. And you may develop too much of one type of bacteria in your microbiome instead of this diversity. So they're not always beneficial. So I use them in certain people, certain strands for just a short time, um, but they can be helpful at certain times. Prebiotics are very helpful all the time. And I don't always recommend taking it as supplements though. Eat your prebiotic food, which is your resistant starch and your fiber. Um, supplements can help a little bit sometimes when people are, are gassy and bloated for prebiotics, but not always. So that's something that um, you can talk to your pr practitioner or play with a little, but it's not something I use all the time. L-glutamine, sorry, it's supposed to be one M and one E, so I apologize about this. I'll fix this after this slideshow today. But um, L-glutamine is an amino acid, and it has been shown to help repair the tight junctions and help beef. It's fuel for those col colons, um, epithelial cells that I showed you, and it can help repair it. It's been shown to do that. So you can take um, one gram, one to two grams, once or twice a day, 
I personally have not found it to be that helpful. I told you what the data shows. The data shows that it's very helpful. I have used it personally myself and I've used it on some patients. I'm not sure if it really helps that much, but um, you're welcome to try a little bit of it. Um, it does have side effects. Everything does. It can cause a little bit of nausea or vomiting or like kind of feeling yucky in your stomach. And um, if people, have, it's been shown that there's certain types of cancer that people have taken super high doses, it promoted it. So um, if you do decide to try a little L-glutamine, I recommend just starting in lower amounts and for short times and making sure that it's okay, like talk to your practitioner. Um, herbs can be helpful for some people. If you have overgrowth of certain bacteria, then I use certain um, different herbs for people, but I don't use it all the time. It's there's certain times. So that's something you can get, you can get your microbiome tested and, or um, based on symptoms, we might use a few herbs in people. Um, but so these are just giving you guys some ideas that, um, at besides for diet, the most important is diet and lifestyle. No question about that. And then beyond that, we may use this for some people who need it. So, um, just to let you guys know. And what about my patient, Amy? So we did this exact plan. Um, we changed her diet to a high fiber plant-based diet. She, um, she blended a lot of her foods initially and, um, chewed it really well. She worked hard on her stress. She was very stressed out when I met her as so many people were doing during COVID days when we were all indoors all the time. And um, she worked on exercise in her sleep. We worked on her sleep together so she gets quality to sleep now. And she's doing great. Her, um, so her throats, well, actually, before when I, I should back up, and um, when I first did labs on her, she turned out to have an autoimmune disease, Sjogren's, causing her dry mouth. So we treated her like an autoimmune person, which would be a high anti-inflammatory diet, healing her leaky gut, restoring her microbiome. And so um, I did exactly what I told you. She ate a high fiber diet. She um, worked on her mind body. Um, she did take some probiotics for a short time. She We gave her vitamin D and B12 and a little bit of zinc. And um, her symptoms are fully resolved completely. And she'd had this for over eight years and um, she can swallow. She's not, she doesn't have a dry mouth. Um, her fatigue is gone. She's joined some local community and doing community work now. So, um, and her food sensitivities are gone. She no longer eats dairy. So I don't know if she has that, but I told her absolutely don't eat dairy, please. And um, she is able to eat spinach now and she's um, able to eat strawberries and citrus, which had bothered her. So uh, she's doing much better. So that is my talk. Oh, that's great. Well, there you really raised a lot of great points there. And I feel like, I don't know how everybody else feels, but I feel like if, if I was Amy, the Amy that you were talking about, I felt like it was like a, a real consultation. That you really gave a lot of good tips on what to do. And it also made me think about how this is a very sensitive, individualized kind of care that when you're healing patients and working with them. And we're going to talk a little bit about this later because you're with plant-based telehealth. So somebody, if they wanted to really address this properly, and they were trying some of the things that you talked talk to them about in the presentation, if that wasn't resolved, that they could make an appointment with you and you're, you've you resolved things for yourself and lots of patients as far as autoimmune and the gut microbiome, you're very familiar with it as we can see in your presentation and you've only scratched the surface, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot more to do. Oh yeah, there's a lot more and it is very individualized. And so what I showed you now is just a brief outline of kind of the idea of it. And everyone can try eating more plant-based and taking out the fat and eating more fiber and resistant starch and um, blending or chewing their food really, really well and working on stress and lifestyle. That's where I recommend everybody start. And that alone helps a lot of people, but a lot of people it doesn't, it's not enough. It wasn't enough for me. My gut was a mess. And so, but there's a lot of steps we can take. If it's important, you do them in order. Like I said, if you start any fermented foods, you're going to be, a, it's going to make things worse or, um, yeah. So, um, so it is individualized and each person is a little bit different. So it's not like it's one size fits all for this one. Mm -hmm. And so often people that are, that tune into, to my broadcast, they're looking at plant-based health, plant-based mm -hmm. lifestyle to yeah. give them health. But I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, you talked about that there, are, it's not just about what you're eating, although that's very important. So, I mean, there are people that may have had like past trauma or emotional scars. I mean, mm -hmm. there are things, others, so you want to kind of expand upon that a little bit. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Amy. Um, thank you. And so we talk so much about in the plant-based world about diet, 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 diet. And so people change their diet. We listen to all these gurus out there who say, eat this way, eat this way, eat this way, eat this way. And we don't all get better. I didn't. And there, that's why I, I studied so much more integrated medicine because it's a big picture, right? We're holistic beings. And so um, if we are stressed out and thinking these thoughts, or if we've gone through a lot of tra um, childhood trauma or recent trauma, divorces or loss of loved ones, I mean, that is going to, that amount of stress is going to change your hormone picture of your whole body and it's going to change your microbiome. No question about that. And whether we're sleeping or not changes our microbiome picture. And um, it's so much related to how we live our lives that, yeah, the diet is super important, obviously, but so is everything else. And so when I talk to my patients, I'm always asking about everything because I want to know and we want to correct it all together. Yeah, because I when I have, I coach people in the plant-based lifestyle and sometimes I'll run across people who say, I just don't think this diet's for me. And mm -hmm. it's, and it may be that they're trying to resolve things like leaky gut or food sensitivities or, or what have you. And no matter how strict they are with the diet, and it's not necessarily going to resolve those things. And you're so familiar with the other aspects of what they may need to do. And it may not just be the food, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's why yeah. I like that we're calling it lifestyle medicine more and more now because it's a whole lifestyle. Um, diet is a huge part of it, but it's not the only part. So I love that we are always, now we're thinking to ask about these other factors because they're really important to us. We know, right? All I know everyone listening, we all have these lives that they affect us. So it's more than just what we eat. Yeah. So uh, Christina has a, a comment and maybe you might be able to address a little bit. She said, I have a very difficult time digesting beans, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. I get terrible stomach pain and greens just go through. Mm, yeah. So um, thank you, Christina, for that comment. Um, I see people, a lot of people like this, actually. And it's a sign that your microbiome is probably out of balance right there because you, that shouldn't be happening. And so um, I would say what I recommend for that is things like greens is to is to blend them initially. Um, so they're blended into smoothies, maybe instead of eating a salad, you eat a blended salad or, or a smoothie um, with not too much fruit in it, just a little bit of fruit to make it taste good. And um, if that doesn't work, and it's still going through you, then you cook them and blend them. And then your gut will start to resensitize to it. And then you can start to you, you want to eat raw, you have to eat raw to heal issues. But um, if, you, if it's if it's messing up your gut when you're eating them, then you can do that and then bring in the raw slowly as you start to improve. And as far as the Brussels sprouts and the um, uh, cabbage, was it and cauliflower or broccoli, those are those can cause gas in people and bloating. And so same idea is to um, well, thanks, broccoli. Oh, beans, that was the other one. Right. So the idea is when you first bring them in, if your microbiome isn't used to a lot of fiber, it can't digest it. You don't have the crocker, proper microbiome to digest the fiber. And so we want to slow it down. So you, some people take it out completely for a week or two and then bring in a tablespoon at a time with lunch and dinner. And then gradually, when that gets better and the gas gets better, then bring a little bit more. And then and you keep on gradually increasing it until the point that you can tolerate it. You want to chew it really well. Unchewed beans, or if they're not well cooked, will cause gas and bloating too. So they're chewed really well. So that's one way to work on that. And then as far as the other vegetables, same idea. Take them out initially. You can cook them initially, chew them really well, and you should start to be able to tolerate them hopefully over time, and then bring them back in raw, chewing really well or blending them. And so there's these tricks to help if it's if it's causing gas and bloating, it's not digesting properly. So to digest it better, chew it. Chewing digestion starts in our mouth. If people tell me, oh, I see undigested food in the toilet, my first thought is, well, then you didn't chew it well because you, sh you should chew it so you can't recognize it anymore. And then the rest of the gut does the rest of the work. So, um, and I eat fast too. So I'm culprit to that as well. But uh, it's important that we do chew it well to prevent this. And so hopefully those will get better. And if you don't, there are tests that we can do. Some people aren't producing enough digestive enzymes or have other reasons, um, bacteria, certain bacteria in the microbiome that can cause gas and bloating. And so if it's not getting better and you've done some of this, um, we can help or see a doctor who can help you um, look for some of these other causes. Right. And I, I've also heard about the, the air bubbles mm. that you, you, you swallow if you 
right? Too wanna... fast, right? If you chew fast, you... I, my very last patient was um, saying she gets a lot of burping after she eats. And I was like, how fast do you eat? And if you eat fast and, and you swallow it, you can definitely get air bubbles or um, caffeine or carbonated drinks can do that as well. Things like that. So, mm -hmm. Okay, so Jerome has an interesting question. Well, a few questions. Why low fat? What about omega-3? And what about plant-based keto diet? Um, so good question. So low fat because the higher fat diets, especially saturated fats, so we're going to get to your omega-3 question, but especially high saturated fat has shown to cause more of that LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and that's a toxin that worsens leaky gut and some of the immune responses people get, especially with autoimmunity and things. And so when people went on a low fat diet, the LPS almost immediately was gone and people, we saw rapid, they saw rapid repair in people. So that's why low fat, but it's especially saturated fat and um, inflammatory fats like the oils. So if you eat um, plant oils, corn oil, soybean oil, some of those oils, those are going to cause inflammation and the LPS and worsen leaky gut. So low fat, what about omega-3s? Um, those are do not count in the low fat category. So um, those are your flax seeds, your chia seeds, a little bit of walnuts, maybe some hemp seeds, your green leafy vegetables, maybe some algae oil for people who are low in omega-3s. And that does not cause leaky gut. Those are so anti-inflammatory that they actually can, um, can help heal your gut lining. So it's not going to cause the LPS because they're a totally different type of fat. So thank you for that. And I'll go back to my slide. High, especially saturated fat and pro-inflammatory fats, um, which the plant-based fats are not, except people who eat high amounts of plant fats too, such as um, peanut butter or um, lots of nuts and seeds, we still have a hard time with their leaky gut. So it's good to eat a little bit of nuts and seeds maybe, but a lower amount. We're not doing, you know, cups of a, a day. So so it still is a lower fat, which is still not very much fat. If you eat basically plants and fiber all day and just a little bit of nuts, that's not very much fat. It's still considered a low fat diet. What about plant-based keto diet? Um, so that is basically eating plants and high things like avocado. I think coconut is in that. Um, you can let me know if that's incorrect, but high amounts of fat. It can be helpful for certain people because you're cutting so many things out. If if part of your leaky gut is due to eating, um, your, in, your individual food sensitivities might be legumes or whole grains. They might be... Um, some of the other plant-based foods. And if, if that's the case, then eating the low, um, the, the keto diet, plant-based diet may be helpful, but in the long run, I don't recommend that. Um, I think it's better to eat more starches and resistant starch and fiber food, rich foods and different types of fiber rich foods to help replenish your microbiome. Okay. Well, that, that was a, a lot of, a lot of good information. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. So Maybe to clarify, when you say a low amount of nuts and seeds in, in measurements, what would you say? Because I think well, everybody has an opinion yeah, about that's that. That's a good question. Um, what I usually recommend is quarter cup or less, which is about four tablespoons. Um, and that's a very small amount. If you use something like Chronometer or My Fitness Pal, and you type in all the food that you eat in a day, and you type in a quarter cup worth of nuts, you'll see it's a very small percentage. It's going to be like just a little over 10% or between 10 and 15%. It's not very much percentage at all. So it is a low fat diet if you eat that much. Um, and it includes some your omega threes, of course, uh, like your flax and chia seeds. So um, yeah, that's what I usually recommend. Now there, once it heals, you can eat more nuts and seeds. It's not forever. This is just, we're just talking the healing phase while people are kind of having all of these problems and we're working on get people better. That's what we do. But once people are better, it's okay to eat more than that. Okay, great. So um, let's see, Jenna said, is juicing a good way to heal the gut? Uh, well, that's a good question. I am a huge fan of juicing, Jenna, and it really helped me. So some people, everything I just described today are not going to get better with those steps and because they're such their gut is such a mess. And I'm one of those. My gut was such a mess. And I just was not getting better with everything I tried. And so I juiced green juices. They're not fruit juices. They're vegetable, green vegetable juices. And um, yes, it gives your gut a chance to rest. When you're not eating, it's 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 healing and repairing itself. And the green juice part is very anti-inflammatory and alkalizing. And so they can be helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And Jenny said, I am whole food plant-based. My adult daughter tried it and said the food makes her constipated. How can she adapt? Yeah, that's a great question. It does that to some people. You'd think all this fiber would move things through. And one good resource I would say to listen to is Dr. Will Bolsowitz. He talks quite a bit about this. He's a GI doctor who's plant-based gastroenterologist based in South Carolina. And he, um, but what what it is, it can be is if you're already constipated and then you eat this food, it it gets more stuff kind of blocked up. So some of the tricks that I do initially are make sure you're drinking plenty of water. Um, the number one reason for constipation is dehydrated, not drinking enough fluids. Um, make sure you exercise, movement. Movement helps you move your stools as well. And you're eating all these high fiber foods. Certain foods like the flax or chia seeds actually can be constipating. So you may want to um, take those out or just do like a tablespoon, not very much for a little bit, see if that makes a difference. And um, I always say eat, make sure you're eating plenty of raw, fresh fruits and vegetables have um, more of the um, insoluble fiber that helps move your stool through. The insoluble fiber is like the harder fiber that moves things through. And so your fresh fruits and vegetables, so like green leafy vegetables, apples, pears, you can try adding dried fruit in like plums or prunes. They're especially known to help with um, moving stools. So I recommend a plan like that. And then if you're still constipated, then you may need a little bit of like magnesium or um, some of those um, laxative type things to get things moving through you. And so, and once you get it cleared out, it should be fine after that. So some people do need a little more aggressive routine at the beginning. And you can talk to your doctor about that. They can help you. Um, I have certain things I use. And I know Dr. Bo Will Bolsowitz has, um, talks a lot about it in his, um, in his book, Fiber Fueled. Yeah, he's a, he's a very good resource. I enjoy mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Trisha said, does apple cider vinegar help with leaky gut? If so, how often and how much? Ah, uh, interesting. So I, I have to look at the data specifically with leaky gut. What apple cider vinegar can help with is people who aren't digesting their food very well because it's a little acidic and um, it can help with digesting your food better. So it can help people who have gas and bloating sometimes. It, help, it definitely helps with um, IBS symptoms, irritable bowel syndrome. They're not the exact same thing. So um, the actual leaky gut part of it, I'm not sure if it helps, except unless you're not chewing your food well and not digesting your food well, then it could maybe help with your digestion, which would then help with your leaky gut. Um, if you do do it, I don't recommend it a ton anymore. I used to. Um, but I've seen people do apple cider vinegar and myself, I'm one of them, added apple cider vinegar to warm water and got a whole bunch of dental cavities. So I personally came up with four cavities after I did that, a few months after I did that. So it's so acidic, it erodes your enamel. And some people like me have more have sensitive enamels and I've seen it happen to other people and I've seen stuff on the internet, people. I don't recommend it anymore because it's not good to erode our teeth. So, um, you know, you put you put vinegar on your salad dressings. We use it in the plant-based world. So I think you should, you know, eat a little vinegar with your meals. Um, but I don't know if you should be sipping. Um, I don't use that typically too much during the day anymore. I feel like the risks are, are not very good. Yeah. And I, I think about that if it did that to your enamel, then, you know, what about everything on the way down? Yeah, or, right. That's you good know, point. What that might do. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So Anthony said, my stomach growls sometimes. Am I I am whole food plant based. Is this a sign of food sensitivity? I don't think so. Uh when does it growl? Is it when you're hungry or is it just after eating or is it just gurgling along as it's digesting your food? Um, no, that shouldn't be a, that's not a sign of food sensitivity. That's I think you probably have a healthy gut unless you're having other problems. So um yeah, I don't think that's a problem. And, oh, well, maybe Naomi came in a late. She said, are, are beans and grains, are they an inflammatory foods? They're not inflammatory foods in general. Um, they're part of their high fiber foods and high resistant starch foods. So they actually are extremely healthy, beneficial, anti-inflammatory foods, extremely. If you have a leaky gut and you have food sensitivities, it's possible that you have a food sensitivity to them. At that point, then you want to take them out for a little bit, heal your leaky gut, and then bring them back in. Okay. Angie said, if you're sensitive to a certain food like garlic, does that mean you can never eat garlic again? 
Um, that's a good question. And uh, no, that does not mean that at all. Food sensitivities definitely improve, and or if you're gassy, you're bloated to that. It definitely improves. And so you want to go back to the beginning and heal your gut, and with a gut healing plan protocol. Um, and once it gets to a healthy place, you should be able to bring it back in. And you may need to start with cooking it first and make sure it's chewed and blended really well and do small amounts, but you can resensitize your gut to it. You know, I had a slide and it didn't show up in my talk today. I must have accidentally deleted it, but it was a difference between food sensitivities and food allergies. Um, food allergies are the IgE, the quick response. You get an allergic type reaction, throat swelling, hives, redness, you know, rashes, lightheadedness, um, low blood pressure. That, those are IgE and things like peanuts or seafood. And you can't eat those foods usually for the rest of your life unless you do some desensitization to it. Um, and those are really bad, but they're much more rare. Food sensitivities is what I was talking about today. And that's an IgG, not an IgE, but IgG antibody. And um, that is into in response to foods you ate. It's a delayed reaction. So anywhere between an hour to three or four days after you eat something, you start to notice joint pains or fatigue or brain fog or these food sensitivities. So those are food sensitivities. And that's what we're talking about today. Food sensitivities definitely can improve. You can heal your leaky gut. You can improve your, the balance of your microbiome, as I showed you, and those heal. Um, food allergies, you usually need, need desensitizations, um, although I have seen some get better, but I don't recommend retesting the food allergies, just the food sensitivities. So it seems like having a food journal would be very useful because of the amount of time that it could potentially take before it, the reaction surfaced. Yeah, it's helpful if you kind of eat simple for a little while and you write down what you're eating and you get an idea. Yep, that's a, the best way to look at what you're eating. I mean, to understand if something's bothering you or not when you're eating it. Yeah, I can ima imagine somebody might eat at a restaurant and the next day they're not feeling well and they think, oh, it must have been that something at the restaurant, may maybe it wasn't. And right? it's so much more complicated yeah. than that. Yeah. Um, so people are going through like, oh, I didn't change anything. I don't know what happened. Or I ate, I eat this all the time, but it's a big picture. And it's not just what you eat. It's how stressed out were you that day? What did you, how well did you sleep that night? Do you have a virus infection going on? All of these play a role. And so it's not just, what you ate. It's not, it's not that simple, unfortunately. So there's a more detective work that has to be done. Okay. Rebecca said, I am whole food plant-based and don't always poop every day. Sometimes I skip a day. Is that okay? Um, well, you want to poop every day if you can. And plant-based people often poop between one and three times. So um, it would be nice to see if that's increased. So basically some of the tips that I talked about um, is maybe a food's uh, food journal so you can take a look at what you're really eating and make sure you're eating high fiber plant foods and unprocessed um, drinking plenty of water getting exercise if you're still not um, going to the bathroom every day then you may need something to help move things through you a little bit but I don't know you or your diet or so it's hard for me to say but um, I would look into that a little bit more okay very nice wow I, I think I think I might have covered all the questions, which is wonderful <laughs> that we were able to get everybody's questions answered. I wanted to, to talk again and give you the opportunity to talk about that you are a plant-based telehealth doctor with plant-based telehealth and that especially people who are going through things like this, they, they may need a little one-on-one. -on -one. So can you talk about that? Um, yeah, thank you. So I work with plant-based telehealth, as you said, and and um, we have, I think we have 11 doctors now. So we're growing all the time. It's very exciting. But um, I am board certified and um, I have my medical license in 24 states right now. So I can see people across the country and it's all um, internet. It's all virtual visits. So it's super fun. People are at home and I'm here in my little home office and we see each other. So we can order labs and do testing and I can work with people or, or one of our other doctors can too. Yeah. And, and that's what another thing that I liked about the plant-based telehealth, because you, if you guys that are watching or listening, I've interviewed almost all the docs on plant-based telehealth and they have somebody, at least one person licensed for mm -hmm. every state and plus they do it internationally. But you want to talk about how you consult with each other as well, right? 
We do. We talk with, to each other, and I'll just give you a few updates. We um, have two new doctors also, so you'll have to do some more interviewing, Amy. And um, uh, we do. We have meetings where we talk about uh, different things we may see, like, oh, I have a patient with leaky gut who's not getting better. Does anyone else have recommendations? And then we'll share stuff. So it's really helpful so we can really come up with answers for people. So, um, yeah, and we actually are having some changes right now. So we're not we don't have every single state covered right now. Um, so but we're working hard. To, we should have that filled hopefully in the next couple months. So, well, that's great. And if, some, if somebody wanted some advice from you, but you weren't licensed in their state, they would still be getting advice from you because probably the doctor that was licensed in their state would be consulting with you, especially if it was something right. to do with the, the gut microbiome, because it seems like that's a big, big specialty of yours. Although you do, you see people for all types of medical conditions. Mm -hmm. I do, but I do see a lot of this. And I think because I've had my own gut issues and autoimmune, I've really delved into it and I had to. And so, yeah, I see a lot of it, but we do all talk, right? Yeah, that's fantastic. I wanted to thank you, Dr. Miller, for the wonderful presentation that you gave to us. And if somebody thought that they had leaky gut or they thought that they had some kind of food sensitivity, what would you suggest the first thing or the first few things, however you want to put it, that they should do? Um, so I would say to simplify your diet, make definitely a whole food plant-based diet, keep a food symptom journal, uh, blend and chew your food super well, eat slowly, um, and focus on kind of easy to digest foods initially. Uh, make sure you're getting... I really like the raw greens um, to help heal. But if you don't tolerate raw, you start with cooked, but then start to get them in. But blend it, chew it well, eat simply, work on your stress level, be mindful and then try to be in a good state and the lifestyle factors and start with that. All right. And if they still couldn't get it right, they could always book a, an appointment with you or somebody else on plant-based telehealth. And we're going to put a link to that in the show notes as well. Well, thanks, Dr. Miller. You're always so generous with your time and you always have so much good information to share with us. And I encourage people to take a look on Be Green with Amy to see on the YouTube to see your past interviews because you've given so much great information. And the guys, at the, the Green Warriors that you're watching and listening, tell us what you're going to remember. What was your takeaway from this interview and this presentation that we had today? And I wanted to thank Just Task Voice. She did the promos and she also did the voiceovers. She's very talented. And Just Task Voice, who's coming up next? Kim F. Awesome is a national motivational speaker, a plant-based boxing champion, and comedian. Learn about his plant-based journey on Be Green with Amy Live, Wednesday, April 27th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Well, I also wanted to thank most of all, all of you that have been listening and watching and commenting and sharing. You're making this movement move, and that's important, getting the word out to other people so that we can try to help people that have not yet heard about this. So I really want to thank you for all of your support and watching and commenting. And I wanted to invite you to sign off with me with my tagline, which is the be strong, be well, and be green. And I'm also going to have Dr. Miller is going to do that with me. Are you ready, Dr. Miller? I'm ready. Okay. Well, until I see you all again, remember, be strong, be well, and be green. Bye-bye. <laughs> Now you can listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be green with Be Green with Amy.